everybody, let's go to page one. Let's talk about some real estate in your textbook. Now, there won't be any nights that I'll hold you over past 10. I'm not going to hold you late. And there may occasionally be time that I'll let you out early. Like tonight, we may finish up a little early and I'll let us go. Um, that won't happen much because we have so much to do in a class like this. But I'm not a big stickler on we got to stay exactly until 10. If we're finished, we're going to say let's call it a night. So is most everybody okay with that? I do have people that have to wait for a ride. I hope everybody, is everybody good if we do let out early? All right. So page one, we're going to learn basic concepts here. And if you'll remember, I said this is level one. I'm not going to overanalyze or overthink this. We're going to hit a few highlights, and then we're going to kind of move on. But there are some terms here you need to know. For example, top of page two, you see in your first paragraph there, real property in bold print. You see personal property in bold print. You see personal T. You see chattel in bold print. And then in the margin, everybody, you see very important point. Let me tell you this. If they have very important point in the margin, it's worthwhile to pay attention to. It's exam content, everybody. I would pay attention. So exam for example, if you're in a hurry and you didn't get all your reading done or you can't get your reading done before class, at least go through and look at your very important points because that is the meat of this unit. The other thing I would pay attention to is any kind of illustration. They're trying to explain to you a little bit more thoroughly any bold uh, words, any uh, examples. On page three, you see in practice. In practice is sort of like saying in real life. And so those are really important things for you to pay attention to. But let's talk about real property and the way they've dissected it for you is illustrated at the bottom of your page. Land all by itself, if you went out and bought a lot, you really are getting way more than what you see. You know, most of us think when we go buy a house, we're just thinking about the house, you know, and how pretty it is, or maybe the fence. Well, look at this illustration. When you buy property, the land is all the way down to the uh, core of the earth, subsurface you own. You own, obviously, the, the top, the surface, and you have air rights all the way to infinity, everybody. So you're getting way more than you can even imagine, uh, probably. Subsurface, surface rights, and air rights. Now think about that. We're going to learn as we go that when you own a parcel of land, you have a right to sell your subsurface rights. <coughs> you have a right to rent your surface. Don't you think farmers rent land from people to plant Christmas trees or uh, to grow, you know, agriculturally? That happens. You have a right to sell your air rights if you want to. I know a builder in town who actually bought air rights, and that seems odd to me, but he was refurbishing two buildings downtown, but they weren't side by side. There, his building was here and another one here, somebody in between. He wanted his buildings to connect because they were taller than this building in the middle. And he approached the, la uh, the lady that owned the building in the middle and um, said, I'd like to purchase your air rights. And I said, Lord John, how did you come up with a number? I just picked a number and she took it. <laughs> Who wouldn't? I mean, really, because are we up there using our air rights? But he bought the air rights that he could connect his two buildings together. That's pretty cool, I think. Now, obviously, as times have progressed over the years, airplanes are up there in the sky. They're using our air over, I mean, if you think all the way to infinity, but that's just progress and there's not too much you can do about it, but you can do something about something like this. What about somebody flying a drone over your property? They're not supposed to. That's interfering. That I'm going to even say that's trespassing. 
What do y'all think? I think so. I think we're going to be hearing way more about drones in the real estate business because flying over somebody's house, I don't know. I think it's an intrusion if you ask me. Now let's look at the middle illustration. Once you have the land as if it's by itself, once something is added to it, they call it a physical improvement. So you add the house you add the garage or the fence or whatever. When we add these things to land, they're called improvements. You know, a fence, a house, a garage, sidewalks, whatever you're adding to that parcel would be an improvement. And that together with the land makes the definition real estate. So real estate is the land and all of the physical improvements attached. Third paragraph over, you've got an illustration. Do you see the bundle of twigs? It's called the bundle of rights. Really and truly, it's called the bundle of legal rights, symbolized by twigs or branches that came from a tree on the property that's being transferred to you. Way, 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 way back in time. People didn't read and write like we did, but property's always been transferred you know, passed down here and there. And the way they symbolized it was literally taking branches or twigs from a tree that was growing on that property, bounding them together, together, and symbolically that transfers the rights to this property. I think that's pretty interesting. Let me show you where that is in your textbook. It's in Unit 2, but let's go ahead and look ahead there. Go with me to page 21. And you can see the information of, uh, you've got the illustration there, the bundle of legal rights, and what each uh, branch stands for. The legal rights, you've got right of possession. You've got rights to control the property. <coughs> you've got rights to enjoy your property. What that means is you have a right to enjoy your property without the worry of third party interference, third party intrusion. Somebody coming knocking on your door saying, my husband sold this house out from under me 40 years ago, I'm here to collect it. Well, you have a right to avoid that. And we'll learn more about that as we go. And you've got a right to, of exclusion. Can't you put a no trespass sign on your property? You have a right for that. And you have a right of disposition. Guys, disposition means you can sell your property, dispose of it. You can transfer it. You can give uh, your real estate. You can sell it. You can will it in most cases. So those are your legal rights. And at the bottom of page 20, it's explaining all of those branches to you that I just summarized. So that's really a very symbolic from the old, old, olden days. Go back with me, if you will, to page uh, two. And let's look up at the first paragraph. As we go forward, if you get a question and it asks you about real estate, or as we go forward, if you get a question and they say, and they use the terminology real property, really the words are going to be used interchangeably unless you get a specific question where they want you to know what makes real property well it's the land and the real estate but that would be a real specific kind of a, a dissecting kind of a question otherwise as we talk about real estate i could say real property and it means the same thing is everybody with me so it's just going to be more generic as we move forward we're just learning how did we arrive at these words now you do have to remember what personal property, uh, what other terms will be used for that. Personal property could be called chattel. Personal property could be called um, personality. I like to tell my students, and no, I wasn't alive back th at this time, but um, um, girl, daughters and wives, used to be the property of the daddies and the husbands. We were chattel. Now this is many moons ago. So chattel is an old-timey word, <laughs> but chattel means movable. 
And so it means movable, it's personal property. So what that means in real estate is the seller, when they sell their home, they get to take their personal property with them. And that even makes sense, doesn't it? That you take your personal property. Look with me, uh, so these first few pages just let you know about land and real estate and real property. Page three, if you go down to your fourth paragraph, you see in bold print a couple of words. One is tenement and one is hereditament. Now, I have to tell you, I've never used those words in my real estate career, never ever, but they are terms of real estate. Tenement is a structure, and hereditament means any rights you have to the real estate that you can will to someone. In other words, somebody has a right to inherit um, that. So hereditament has to do with inheritance. Tenement has to do with a structure. Let's go to page four. You've got some information here about the physical and the economic characteristics of real estate. Economically, guys, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this because you all know it already. You know about supply and demand. You know about if an item is scarce. What's going to happen if an item is scarce? <clears throat> Prices go up, don't they? Uh, uh, golly, just think about um, shoes that come out, these sports shoes or these new iPhones. People wait in line and camp out to get them, and what do you think is happening to the price? The price is going up because it's a scarce, uh, scarcity at the beginning. And so real estate will be affected by uh, scarcity, supply and demand, location. What kind of improvements do you have on the property? Now, improvements can also be, are you on a paved road? Do you have street lighting? Do you have sidewalks? Uh, all of that could be an improvement uh, to the uh, real estate. I really want us to look at the physical characteristics. Real estate is immobile. That makes sense, I hope, to you, golly. If we own the land all the way to the core of the earth, you can't take that with you. It's immobile. Real estate is indestructible. Now that one makes me ponder a tiny bit because, you know, we're having storms and there are earthquakes and there are mudslides. So real estate is indestructible, meaning again, it's there to the core of the earth. Maybe what's on top gets destroyed, but the land itself is still there, indestructible. Uniqueness is one that you'll be tested on for sure, and uniqueness is something that we'll talk about again when we talk about contract law. I want you to take a minute, though, if you will read your last paragraph on page four about uniqueness. <clears throat> ever seen a neighborhood, a new construction neighborhood? D.R. Horton is a subdivision builder and you drive through the neighborhood and a lot of the houses look the same, don't they? Well, the improvement may look the same, but the property is unique because of the location of it. So if one house is on the corner and another house down the street <coughs> looks just the same, guys, the geography of it is different and that's what makes it unique. Unique uh, property is unique, meaning it cannot be replaced for no amount of money. Let me get you to highlight a sentence and I'll explain it to you. On the bottom of page four, your third line down. In fact, it's the uniqueness of each parcel of land. Parcel of land is piece of land, lot, that gives rise to the remedy of specific performance. 
the party um, uh, for breach of a sales contract. Let me put that in real words. What if a buyer and a seller have agreed uh, and they're under contract? Seller has agreed to sell their property to a buyer for X amount of money. The buyer has agreed and they're under contract. Signed, everybody's under contract agreed. Let's say that the seller a uh, week or so later says, you know what? I think I sold this property too, uh, too cheap. I think I could have gotten some more money. I don't like this feeling that I left some money on the table. I'm not going to honor this contract. So if there's a real estate agent, the real estate agent's going to say, and seller, the buyer will have a right to sue you. It's called specific performance. Here's what it means. Because that property is unique, the buyer cannot replace that property for no amount of money. And the courts in North Carolina have ruled because it's unique, the buyer has a right to force that sale, specifically perform the contract. Rise to the remedy means there is legal recourse and the buyer can take the seller to court, specifically perform the terms of this contract because this property is unique, I cannot replace it. No money will replace it. Seller might say, well, there's a house right down the street just like mine. It's not just like yours. You're here, it's over here. It's not just like yours. So remedy means solution. Remedy means legal solution. And so the courts have favored buyers on this, to be honest with you, in North Carolina. They haven't been very favorable if a buyer were to say, I'm backing out, and the seller says, I want to make them buy my house. That even sounds funny, doesn't it? You know, you, the, the courts are not going to favor that, trying to make the buyer buy, because the courts will say something like this. But seller, what have you lost? You haven't lost anything. There's no harm to you. You still have that unique property that you can go sell. Seller yell and scream, I lost my sale, I lost my time, I lost this money. You still have the unique uh, property that, uh, has, it, that is irreplaceable. So that specific performance, we will look at that again when we get into contract law and talking about contract, but it would be a breach of contract someone breaking the contract if they didn't want to honor what they said they were going to do. Economic characteristics, you know, the scarcity, the location. There is another word for location and area preference. It's called situs. You know, certain people want to be in a certain part of town. So it's more than saying, I want Northwest. It might have a little more uh, um, personal preference to it. For example, I can remember when we bought our house, our boys were really little, so I wanted to be uh, located where we could get to McDonald's fast and get to school fast, you know, kind of located like that. So it was more than being Northwest, it was something else that we preferred too, and that terminology is called situs. It's locational, but it's got, our, it's got more preference in it too, uh, other than just the location. And so improvements, we said, um, adding something to the property, buildings or roads or sidewalks. And if you look at your last paragraph, uh, permanence of investment. Think about a developer coming in and getting a lot ready to uh, uh, build on. Don't you think they're making some improvement there? Um, they're putting money in that they're not going to ever be able to get out. When they start grading that lot, when they start putting in well and septic or city water and sewage and getting all of that done, they literally cannot take that with them. So it's a permanent, that part is a permanent investment. Next page, six and seven. This is an introductory unit. So we will see, um, <clears throat> we will address in the other units some of this information. So for example, highest and best use, I would highlight that what that means. Golly, that might even be a test question. Highest and best use is the, uh, the use that will give the uh, greatest return on the investment. You could even say it's the most profitable use of a property on any given day. 
Now, I'm not insinuating that your highest and best use will change every day. It doesn't, but it would be as of a specific time, uh, that property, what is its highest use? For example, those of you that have lived in Greensboro for a long time, the Greensboro Coliseum didn't, was it all sprawled out like it is now. The Greensboro Coliseum didn't have all the um, um, supplemental parking. Across the street was a lumber yard. I remember it when I was growing up. I remember on one side of the Coliseum, there were stores there. There was a company called Tobacco USA, and they sold um, other products other than tobacco, but they sold coffees and uh, uh, gifts and candies and lots of things like that. Guys, it's not, those are not there anymore because the land is more valuable and useful as a parking lot. Golly, UNCG has sprawled out toward the Coliseum, and there where the lumber yard across the street was, uh, there, uh, UNCG has parking there where the buses come pick the students up to take them to class. And so the highest and best use of that land now is a parking lot. So it changes over time. And you can even maybe relate that terminology to what is the zoning? What is the best use? Zoning and use of the land kind of go together, like residential zoning, agricultural or industrial or commercial. We will talk in unit six about land use controls. We're gonna learn about public land use controls, which zoning is involved in that. And then we're gonna talk about private land use controls, which would be like restrictive covenants. When you move into a subdivision, a newly developed subdivision, the developer probably came up with some restrictions, some rules for the people who live here. Like, if you're building a house in this neighborhood, we want it to be at least this many square feet, because if it's less than that, don't you think it will affect the value of everybody else's house that's there? Um, restrictions like you can't have any Rottweiler dogs or pit bull dogs in this neighborhood. Restrictions like don't paint your house purple, you know, so the restrictions can be whatever the developer decides to put in the restrictions as long as they're not against the law. You know, it can be uh, stricter than what uh, zoning is. Real estate as an investment. Well, most of us know real estate's a good investment. However, it's really better as a long-term investment. You know, real estate is one of those things that the longer you hold it, the better return you're probably going to get. Even though during the financial crisis, um, people who had money probably got even richer because they bought properties that were in foreclosure. People who were having hardship, it was a benefit to other people. I mean, that's just the way the world works, isn't it? And so uh, people buying those properties and you heard the terminology, I'm gonna flip this, I'm gonna put a little money in it and sell it for more. Guys, that's that was a little bit trending then. You don't really hear that much about investors buying and flipping property. It's not the trend word like it was back then. I'm not saying investors don't do it, but it really became a buzzword back in those times. Yes, you can buy a house and fix it up and turn around and sell it, but typically speaking, real estate is a buy and hold kind of an investment. Disadvantages of real estate as an investment? Well, it's not very liquid. I don't know, have you ever owned stock? If you've ever owned stock, I bought some when my kids were little just for fun. We bought some McDonald's stock just for fun to watch it a little tiny bit. Not much money in there. But can you just call your stockbroker up any day and say, I want to sell today. Done. It's in your bank. Guys, you can't do that with real estate, obviously. You know, it's not a liquid. You can't just turn it into cash like that. It's a longer term kind of an investment. If you want to sell it quickly, you might end up taking less money than what you, um, what you might be able to get for it. Go with me to page eight, please. Real estate as a, a specialty. I want you to make sure you understand the word brokerage because we'll use that term as we go through real estate brokerage. It's the business of bringing together to, uh, buyers and sellers in a real estate transaction. 
Golly, I just talked about stock, stock market. What about stockbrokers? Don't they bring together buyers and sellers in the stock business, stock market? Well, real estate brokers bring together buyers and sellers. Look at your paragraph right under that. Is everybody with me on page eight? There's your first license rule, everybody. And like I told you, it's gonna be peppered throughout your textbook. There's your first one. It's telling you who needs a real estate license. So let me just paraphrase it and give you an example. What if your mama calls you up and your mama owns a, um, an apartment building? And your mama says, we're gonna, your dad and I are going to be traveling Europe for the summer. Will you manage this apartment building for us while we're gone? All you have to do is collect the rent, just kind of be on call for us, and we'll give you a couple of hundred, five hundred bucks maybe uh, to do that for us. Guess what? You need a real estate license to do that, even if you're doing it for your mama. The key is this. If you're acting like a broker, for somebody else, it doesn't matter who that is, for compensation or the promise of compensation, the real estate commission says you're acting like a broker and you need a real estate license. Now that sounds a little strange maybe to you, and I think it is a little tiny bit because I think that there are a lot of people out there doing this because they don't know they can't do it. And you know, there's not, a, there's not a rule book that the governor sends out. Now here's the rules. If you want to do this, you got to have this license or that license. I think there are folks that do this because they don't know that it triggers under a real estate commission that you should have a license. Now, what if your mama says, will you manage our apartment building while we're out of town? And I want you to do it for free because I raised you. You owe me something. You don't need a license for that. You can, it, it has to come with compensation. So let's look at this oppositely. If you want to sell your own house by yourself, do you need a license? No, because it's not for somebody else, it's for you. If you want to list your house, if you want to buy a house yourself, just yourself, you don't need a license to do that. It's the for others and for compensation that triggers the licensing of it. So that's a test question, everybody. I'm telling you, it's license law. You need to know who needs a license. And by the way, the Real Estate Commission has a right to intervene if they find out that someone is acting like a broker without a license. The Real Estate Commission can seek court action, and what they're asking for is an injunction. Stop acting like a broker without a real estate license. So that would be possible. Alrighty, other sources of, um, or other specialties we could argue. People who come to a real estate school don't always go into the brokerage part of it. People say, I think I'd like the appraising part. Some people say, I think I want to be a teacher or I want to go into property management or banking or something like that. So as we go through the course, you may see other areas that you think will uh, be more interesting to you. We have lots of students who've decided that they would like to pursue appraising. Uh, I can think of several of our students that are in appraising now because that kind of piqued their interest when we started talking about it. So if you get interested in that, we can hook you up or at least give you somebody to talk to about that. Look at the bottom of page nine with me. And it's about professional organizations. Now I know that I have not said the word realtor. Have you heard me say it? I haven't said realtor. So when you get your real estate license, everybody, you're not a realtor. It's a word that's gotten to be generic it's a word that people really use incorrectly. Um, the, public, uh, if, uh, the public will use the word, my realtor is showing me houses, instead of saying my agent is showing me houses. A realtor is a trademark name. A realtor means you joined a professional organization called the Association of Realtors. It's the largest trade organization in the United States. Lots of members. And so it is important to become a realtor. It helps you in your field. Let me tell you the big benefit. Uh, there are a lot of benefits. 
one big benefit is multiple listing service. Have you heard of multiple listing? If you are a real estate agent and a buyer calls you and says, I'm looking for a house with these uh, amenities, these qualities. If you are a realtor, you can go search that big database, MLS, and look for houses that are other real estate agents' listings and show to this buyer because you're a member. The MLS is run under the Realtor Association. So if you want to be in the real estate business, you will uh, have to become a realtor because your real estate company is a realtor probably. And if the company's a realtor, you'll have to be. Of course, there will be dues associated with that. Now, I do want to point out to you, and, and I, don't, I don't think I need to, but when you decide to go into the real estate business, you're going to be a self-employed person. You're kind of starting a business under a business. You will be an independent contractor. You will not get a salary. You will not get any benefits. You are opening your own company in a way, figuratively if you will, under the umbrella of a real estate firm. You could say it's a pretty little investment uh, to uh, the amount of money that you're spending for your education. I know it feels like a lot, but when you think about opening your own business, being the boss of yourself, it's a little bit compared to a lot of companies that you can open. Now, having said that, when you first start out, you are going to have to spend a little bit of money joining the Association of Realtors and paying for MLS membership. So I would start saving and count on about $1,500 out of the chute for that. And it doesn't mean it's an everyday expense, but the, if you join the Greensboro Association, uh, there's a $500 initiation fee. And then they're gonna tell you what your dues are, and they're gonna tell you what your MLS fees are. And so you might be writing a big check when you first start out. After that, you'll be paying dues periodically. I would suggest budgeting maybe $150 a month. You know, as far as expenses in real estate, the biggest expense I'm going to think is going to be your gas. It's going to be getting your own computer and stuff like that. But at the very beginning, you're going to have to um, get your affiliation, and it's going to be a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. is, that the, um, is that related to the group that meets at Logan's like every Tuesday at 11? You that group? No. Like, Sounds like um, an investment group. That's not the realtors, I don't think. I mean, realtors can group out and do what they want to, but the Association of Realtors have thousands of members. And so uh, they do have monthly meetings and where they keep us informed of things that are going on. There's a board of directors, a president. So it's a, a membership that will just keep you in the loop of what's going on. Um, lots of other benefits other than that, though. All right, go with me to page 10. If you look at the, uh, your first paragraph, really, you see Realtors, Realtor Associates, Realtor Trademark, but you also see a sentence, um, I'm in your first paragraph, third line from the bottom. All Realtors are brokers, but not all brokers are Realtors. Guys, when you get your broker's license, you are not a Realtor. You have to join. The association so and not every broker wants to be a realtor golly what if you get a broker and you're just doing a little bit on your own on you know just a little bit part-time you might not see the benefit of, it, of, of paying those dues and fees to be a realtor but if you're in the real estate business as a career and you want to make something and uh, out of your business joining the Realtors Association would be something that will be very very helpful very good Alrighty, so I mentioned the uses of real property at the bottom of page 10. And on 11, we talked about supply and demand already a little bit. And I know that you guys have an understanding of it, so I'm not going to uh, go over um, uh, this section um, very much, really, because we all, golly, we're adults, we know about supply and demand. Let me tell you a cute little story, because uh, children even learn it. When my boys were little, they were really little. They may be four or five years old. They wanted to open a lemonade stand in the, um, it was summer, they wanted a lemonade stand in the front yard. 
And so they came in the house, they got all these cups, filled them up with ice and lemonade, and they're sitting out in the, on a table uh, in front of the house. Then one of my boys comes in the house, Mama, our lemonade's not selling, the ice is melting, and nobody's stopping to buy our lemonade. I said, drop the price, because there's not a demand. I taught them about supply and demand there. I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but we all understand what that means, don't we? Drop the price, and you know what they did? I guess they're built-in salespeople. They got their lemonade and started going around knocking on doors. You want to buy a cup of lemonade? I mean, it's kind of cute. But guys, that's supply and demand in real life, right? If you've got supply and it's not selling, people drop the price. Have you heard? I know you've heard this. Have you heard it's a seller's market? Have you heard it's a buyer's market? When there's a whole lot of inventory, a whole lot of houses on the market, we would call it a buyer's market because the buyer's in more control. They've got more houses to choose from. They're in control. If they see one house that they want to make an offer on and that seller won't budge, hey, there's another house we can make an offer on. Right now, we're in a little bit of a seller's market. There's not much inventory. And that means the seller can kind of hold tight to the price that they want. They can be more firm because their buyer doesn't have much to choose from. It's about supply and demand. All right. Go with me, if you will, just real quick. I'm only going to take a, a little bit longer. Go with me, if you will, to page 19. I just want to introduce chapter 2 to you. And um, just so that we can say we got started in it, because unit two is going to take all night, Wednesday night. There's a lot in this unit. But didn't we talk on page 20 about our bundle of legal rights already? And we even looked at our uh, illustration with the, with the branches symbolizing each legal right. Look with me at the middle bottom of page 21. There's a term there that we will see as we go through the text. Is called a pertinence. And a pertinence means a right or a privilege that transfers with the real estate. And a pertinence is a right or a privilege that transfers with the real estate. And so the reminding us it might be like those air rights. It might be like those surface or subsurface rights. And then they're even bringing up water rights. So let's talk about that a little bit, and then we'll call it a day, call it a night. Look with me at the bottom of page 22, and you see water rights. Water rights, what kind of ownership interest do you have if your land is adjacent to a body of water? The water rights in North Carolina we're talking about would be referred to as riparian. Is everybody seeing that term? Riparian rights. Riparian means water rights. Look at your last paragraph. Riparian rights are granted to owners of land located along the course of a river, stream, or lake. Look at the next sentence and I might would highlight it. Such an owner has the unrestricted rights to use the water, provided it does not harm owners upstream or downstream by interrupting the flow of the water or contaminating it. So if you are adjacent to a body of water, you've got the unrestricted right to use the water. Unrestricted means exactly that. So look at your top of page 23 at the illustrations here. Bodies of waters are either navigable water or non-navigable. Guys, I looked up the definition of navigable. In the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, navigable means a commercial vessel can use that water for commerce. Now think about it for a minute. If you got a creek behind your property, do you think it's navigable? Probably not. There's not going to be a commercial vessel getting to the intercoastal water right away, a stream or a creek. However, if you were adjacent to a river or to a lake, that body of water is probably navigable. I'm not saying always, but if you're asked on a test, if it asks you about a river or a lake, I'm going to say that's navigable. 
Guys, it matters when we look at uh, what your ownership goes to, how, where your ownership of the land goes to. Look at your illustration on the top of 23. If you are adjacent to a stream or a creek, you have ownership rights to the exact middle of the creek or the stream. Everybody see that? If you are adjacent to a river or a lake, your ownership rights are not the same. You would own to the edge, the border, the edge or the bank of the water. Look at your bottom illustration. If you are adjacent you, uh, on the ocean, you own property near the ocean on the ocean. Your water, your use of the land is a little bit different. Oceans, everybody, are large bodies of waters that have tides to them. Any body of water that has a high and a low tide, it tells you where you own, uh, where you own your land to, and it would be to the average high water mark. So if you are uh, near bodies of waters with tides, you own to the average high water mark. For example, isn't there a place in the United States where there are some lakes called the Great Lakes? Y'all heard the Great Lakes, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Big lakes, mm -hmm. movies that look like they're like they're on the ocean. They were filmed on the Great Lakes, guys. Those lakes have tides. A large lake with a high and a low tide, you would own to the high water mark. So it's oceans or great bodies of waters that have high and low tides. So your ownership would be different. Now just real quickly, just as a little aside, unfortunately real estate's not that cut and dry. Unfortunately real estate's not that black and white. If I went out to, if I got a call from somebody who owns a property and they call me to come look at their house to put on the market, and I'm walking around the yard and I notice that they're adjacent to some water, I am not going to make any assumptions. I'm going to ask, where does your land go to? How much does it cost? What can you do on that water? Who cleans it up? Tell me about it. The whole idea is we're learning basic information that you've got, a, you've got this basis of education that you can start the conversation and ask these people, tell me about where your ownership rights go to. Real quickly, Lake Norman, the people don't own to the edge of that water. Somebody else owns Lake Norman, do power. So wouldn't it be important to ask somebody that has a house on Lake Norman, wouldn't it be important for me to say, what can you do with that water? Uh, how much does it cost you to get into the water, to get a boat in the water? So it isn't always we're gonna make these assumptions, but the knowledge you're getting at least will, will give you the information that you can ask these questions without making assumptions. So as we go through the course, that's what we're going to be learning. You're going to ask and have the discussion because you're learning about it. Makes a little sense? When we are together Wednesday night, we're going to, we're going to get through Unit 2 the best that we can. There's information in Unit 2. Now don't get up, I got your packing of homework. There's information in Unit 2 that if you're not careful, it will bog you down. And let me make it better for you right now. When you start talking about, the, uh, reading about the estates in Unit 2, guys, it's level one. Don't let it bog you down. I will break it down and make it as easy as possible, but I'm gonna tell you it's only level one. So level one means recognize what the terms mean, you know, for definition-wise. 